Hello, I'm Marv. Today we're going to discuss that. Before I even really knew what it meant, I felt what it meant, because you'd hear people complaining about a movie being, oh, that's too melodramatic. Oh, that's melodramatic, as if melodrama is terrible or something, but uh, all, you know, all folk tales, all ancient stories, things that are so durable and are still entertaining to this day are melodrama, and it's just, I think what people are cringing at is an acting style. Acting styles keep evolving and people are made uncomfortable by discarded acting styles and that, that is like putting a giant magnifying glass on the melodrama and it actually seems to distort the truth behind a melodrama and a distorted truth is untrue but the object of melodrama is to just disinhibit the truth. But yeah, it's out of style. Yeah. Except on reality shows, which needs melodrama, melodrama. It needs people to be plotting against each other and betraying each other. And, you know, um, you know it needs, needs that because it's reality. Right. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about, because you mentioned as well in the introduction and now as well, uh, about the, most, the strangest thing to me that, I, that you said was that you were shooting in public Meaning like you were shooting at the Pompidou and then at this place in Montreal? Yeah, anyone, watch anyone could watch. Anyone, uh, it was before you paid, um, before you paid admission to the, uh, to the museum, whatever it cost, 20 euros or 10 euros or something. Uh, there's a massive foyer and we set up a set right there. And you know, by massive I mean, oh, like the size of, maybe like the size of a football field or something. I, that's, I'm misremembering it a little bit, maybe a little bit smaller you know, from the, between the 20 yard lines maybe, I don't know, but it's, it's big. And, um, and then uh, you could also watch from railings on three sides from above. And so there was a, a bank of seats that was actually a stairway leading down and then the rails around and anyone could come and watch. And on some days there would maybe be this many people watching at the most. And then on other days, if we were shooting, you know, like a close-up of a doorknob or something like that. Actually, we never had a doorknob because we couldn't afford doors. <laughs> so, but um, a close-up of something without, a, you know, without, um, and with, it didn't, you know, without nudity or something like that. You know, there, uh, sometimes it was down to three or four people. There was always, there were always a few alarming regulars. People that just never went away. You wonder why, and you'd, you, every now and then you'd remember, oh yeah, I'm shooting in public. I wonder if anyone's watching, and you'd look and there'd be a man staring at you, you know. And, um, and we were uh, just right about where that door is, there was the cruisiest bathroom in Paris. It was right there too, and that's where all the crew and the actors uh, relieved themselves as well, or adjusted their makeup. And there was, it was also, um, a great drug dealing place. I don't know, it was just sort of an inter already interactive and people watching from above would literally drop half-chewed baguettes onto the actors and things like that and we just keep rolling, you know, we're really excited about it. And, and the people in the foyer that weren't watching us were making a lot of noise, talking, and, and there were so many voices, you know, maybe a thousand voices some days, um, in a very cavernous space that was never built to be acoustically friendly. So it, the, the voices all blended together into a kind of a seashell like, um, you know, sound of the ocean. And, um, and that you, but and you, were film, you were recording some? Yeah, yeah, we were recording the dialogue. Not much, obviously, but some. And, uh, but we just, you know, the sound person is going, we, we can't record this, you can, but uh, I just listened, I went, yeah, you can't even tell those are voices, you know, it's just kind of, and, and we layered so much acoustic crap, you know, just sort of scratchy woolen blankets, cozy comforters of acoustic, you know, feathered duvets of acoustic rubbish, <laughs> duvets stuffed with garbage, <laughs> sort of, we t tried to tuck ourselves in and make ourselves cozy with all these layers of sound that just sort of, t I don't know, just made the voices a little more, more distant still from the real world that we all know. They have Margo, and who knows what they're doing to her. We all have our axes and our brawn. Strong men. We just have to get together and attack. Yeah! Can you talk a little bit about that more, like about the sound and the process of... Because I feel like the sound in your films are, at least, and in this one in particular, is not... Um, doesn't flow exactly like in most films. It feels uh, perhaps 
I yeah, I feel it this. It wasn't ear. very loud in here today, but that's okay. Yeah, you know, you ears. didn't. No one's eardrums are bleeding. But yes. I'm not a student here, but I, I wanted to say I really enjoyed the music, and I wondered how the and the way it was edited. Okay. And I wondered who Thank you. did you choose? Well, uh, it was a bit of a, a team effort. My editor and my production designer and I just made took public domain recordings and just. We couldn't afford a composer, and so we just uh, chopped them up or looped them or mushed them together. And Galen, who's the production designer and the graphic artist who did the 600 Indie titles, was also an excellent music designer, it turns out. He just did it because we needed music, but he's, he got better and better at it. And I was really pleased with it. And every now and then he just does it for fun, you know, the way someone might bake a cake or something like that. He'll send me something new he's cooked up, and it's... It's really pleasant. I've always enjoyed, my way into movie making was watching um, a local filmmaker back at Winnipeg when I was in my 20s make very primitive but really alive films and then later Lage d'Or by Bunuel, an amazing film everyone should see. It's really handmade, and you can tell. You can tell how it's made. Uh, Eraserhead makes you think about how the sound's edited. Those are early thrills for me. Since then, Oscar Micheaux, the girl from Chicago, say there's a movie that announces at every frame its, its human manufactured quality. And, and I like being aware of things being I like being able to see the brush strokes or hear the accent. Um, it just reminds me of being a child and being told a bedtime story by my grandmother and being told perhaps even the same story for the seventh time and thinking, well, gosh, she's sitting on my feet. I guess, you know, my feet are asleep. Or she's not telling the story very well this time. She told it better last time, but I'm still enjoying it. Or if she tells it really well and I'm sleepy and it's cozy with her sitting on my feet and the blankets are just right, and, I'm, and I open my eyes and I can still see my grandmother, but I'm also in the story, and sort of it's a simultaneous thing, but too, so many times on a set, at least up in Canada, you would just hear, you're breaking the dramatic illusion if you have bad continuity, or you, if you have this or that, you know, you've got to, you've got to make sure the lighting is, has a logical source, and uh, you've got to make sure the sound has perspective and things like that. But then when I watched my, when my daughter was four or five years old, I just watched her cutting and pasting and gluing and scribbling and making something really moving and honest and in just a couple of minutes. And I, I realized that's to me. So now, so, so many fewer mistakes happen with digital filmmaking. This is all digital. Um, that, that it's hard to, you almost have to go out of your way to be, to be primitive. <laughs> You know, and, a, and a, sound, a person doing a sound mix for you has to really be on board with you because they're, they're trained to smooth out all that stuff. And they'll fix what you, what you so uh, stubbornly made sloppily. <laughs> they'll fix it for you. <laughs> and they'll yeah, EQ it uh, and guys, smooth it out. Yes. Uh, quick question. Sure. Thanks. Uh, going back to your choice of shots, I'm curious about whether or not having mostly medium close-ups and close-up shots, there's not many master or live shots. Right. Piece, right. Um, is That's that a good, it's very true, are, by the way. Yeah, right. There's not much a, it, like, is that towards narrative device, or is that due to resources and, lot, and not being able to do what you want to do with having a master shot? Yeah, like, yeah. Do you feel limited, and does that affect your process at all? It started out with me having very little. I started out in my first few movies as just having, say, a very small set. And I also, maybe the nature of the scripts I was writing, I was writing, my way of entering into writing fiction was like almost like bedtime stories or fairy tales. So I felt like I had to make, and I felt that sets looked better if you just unplugged almost all the lights so that um, the actors were lit in the middle and they were sort of in a womb of darkness. I felt cozier and it seemed to fit the stories. That there was a bedtime story a dimension to the gestures and everything in, in the story. And I liked that little comfy, Cocoon, it, so it fit the story and it fit my budget for sets, as you, uh, and it's, it's true, I almost never have wide shots. And I, um, 
But as I started to get a bit more money for movies, I, in 2003, I had my biggest budget. I had like $3.5 million. Um, this one is about $600,000 if you add up the eight other hours of finished movie for the internet. But so it was lower budget. We didn't have a big set. The set for most of the things we shot was just a little bit bigger than this carpeted area here. Um, what happened is um, I just, as each picture went on, I started to learn, especially when I started to move the camera, I, I learned, to, I always shoot with two cameras, by the way. I have a person, a trained DOP that gets more um, conventional shots, uh, sort of establishing shots, and then conventional medium two shots and, and some close-ups, but I'm, I'm the one that gets to be the free agent who roams around and keeps searching for things. And if the shot's out of focus and then goes into focus, that's me. Uh, I'm trying to find, first of all, the focus ring. And then secondly, the, 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 the exact angle that looks good to me. I don't know. I can't plan it ahead. But I noticed in this movie where I had the big, bud, the big for me budget in, in 2003, I, I asked my producer and got, uh, asked for and got, um, uh, I used to design my own sets and I wasn't very good at it, um, a, production, a real industry production designer and he made really big sets. There were sets as big as this room and bigger and t uh, taller uh, ceilings. And then uh, when I uh, f started editing the movie, I realized I just shot in one tiny corner Anyway, I just put up a light and found a little corner that I liked and, and I forgot to have an establishing shot and a movie that you apparently showed in class, Heart of the World, I had a really big set built for that and at the end of shooting, I realized I hadn't shot it once and so I went back and I had someone uh, try on the, uh, just put on the costume of the leading lady and, and, and I got back and I started, I, I got the entire set that I built with the per, a body double wearing the costume in there. And then I went, oh, that's enough. And I just did one shot of that even. And so as it is, I only have really one shot in my entire career of, of something as big as this, you know. I, I'm just sort of interested in faces and hands. And, um, and the way I, I shot this ballet version of Dracula in 2001, and I discovered without knowing, I didn't know much about ballet, and I, I was bored with the Dracula story. But somehow, uh, the two of them stuck together appealed to me and I got interested in it and I was really surprised by how much acting ballet dancers do with their faces because I always watched from far away before and also with their fingers and then with every muscle in their body of course so I learned that there was a melodramatic disinhibition there that was kind of intriguing and so that probably reinforced an already strong tendency to go close all the time and it, I know it can be disorienting and I'm really making a vow next movie to slow the frantic camera movements down and to try to write a script that calls for establishing shots and then I don't want to do traditional coverage I don't think there's much point in that anymore but just to use the vo full vocabulary and use it smartly and allow myself to be crazy now and then, you know, but because the script still has to be sort of insane for me to be interested in it. But, um, but uh, good eye, uh, it's, it's true, I have no est establishing shots. You know, I don't even know where I am. Like, I wish real life had establishing shots. I <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, did you steal my boat's head? Yes, no, maybe. Ah, you thought you would get away. You did not. You will face the volcano. Can you talk a bit about the structure of the film? Because the structure is such a puzzle. <clears throat> you know, it's stories within stories within dreams. And, so you, and then eventually... You the structure is... And then there's a moment where you wake up, and so, like, or a character will wake up in a different level. Yeah, yeah. Well, this, the structure is something... I think I'd been looking for an excuse to use this structure, and I'm well aware of its limitations. I know the movie gives no indication that it's ever going to end uh, or, until or it, it ends. Many yeah, yeah, yeah. Every, every no, exactly. And how many times can you do that? Um, but after we'd shot all the, and this, I don't want it to sound like an excuse because it'll it will at first. I'll warn you. Um, we shot this stuff to be the raw matter for an internet interactive, and they were never meant to be seen together or in their entirety, but. Uh, they're, meant to be, they're meant to be little spirits that interrupt each other and form an inf a near infinite number of 
non sequitur addled permutations and combinations that are over briefly. Um, so when we suddenly found out we had to shoot a feature just to access the funds, I was secretly delighted because I looked at, I realized if I just worked on this internet project for the next few years, uh, so many years will have passed without my making a feature. And, I, I'd, um, and I'd always wanted to, ever since seeing this movie called The Locket, which is a great film noir melodrama, in which there's about three men that are all involved with the same woman. And um, the one man uh, is getting, on his wedding day, is getting married to that woman when another man comes and warns him not to marry her. And, they, and you go into a flashback about his relationship, man number two's relationship. And in that story, he's just about to get married to someone when a, man number three comes and, and warns him against marrying that woman. And then that man, number three, actually um, gets to interrogate the woman at one point, And she talks about her past. And there's a little trauma. And it's called the locket. And in her past, she has a trauma, a tiny little silver vaginal locket that contains some sort of mystery. And then it works its way back out um, to man number three, two, and then one again. And, and it is so pleasing to come out. To go, to go in is one thing, but to come out and go, oh yeah, there's all this, and, and it casts in relief everything. I've always loved it, but while watching, and that movie's perfect. This is not perfect. Th that movie's perfect, and um, for so many reasons that um, we don't have time to discuss now, but I remember just saying, I wonder how many movies you could nest, how many stories you could nest inside of each other. Someone's got to try that someday. And then I discovered the French writer Raymond Roussel, who spent his entire writing career doing just that. His poem, New Impressions of Africa, starts with a line of poetry. Then there's a parenthesis with a sort of a digression. And then, and then before that digression's quite finished, there's another parenthesis that starts another digression until it works its way to the center of this approximately 80-page poem. And then it starts closing the parentheses. And you can either read the poem with like your fingers at the end, the beginning and the end, and then work your way to the middle, or you can try to remember these countless digressions. And he had a number of short stories and novels written in the same fashion, um, documents to serve as an outline, translated by John Ashbery, who wrote the um, framing device for our movie, The How to Take a Bath. Um, uh, learned French so he could read Raymond Roussel back in the 50s. And, and anyway, the, the books don't uh, abide... Um, conventional literary uh, objectives. Uh, they don't s seem to be too concerned with human psychology, whereas I care, and um, in a fairy tale sense anyway. And uh, they just seem so mysterious. You don't know why he's doing this. And everybody, char everyone's characters' names seem to be determined by a machine instead of by a human imagination. They're really odd. And, and it's true, he finally wrote a book on how he wrote certain of his books and and there was a strange method to it all based on puns, but then skipping like prime number <laughs> consonants and things. Um, it's kind of crazy. And even at Raymond Roussel's death, he was found dead of a heart attack, I think, just inside a locked door with a key in his hand. And knew, no one ever found out whether he was locking himself in or trying to get out. And he's just an enigma. And um, I just thought faced with the prospect of having to make a feature out of a bunch of stories, um, our options were to make a mockumentary, which I didn't want to do, or a, a, a documentary on lost films, which I just didn't have the energy to do, or to, or to superficially emulate Raymond Roussel's structure. And, and what it is, it's just simply, in the, it's just a three-act thing, but it's just not a conventional three-act structure. In the first act, there are six nested narratives, starting with a bath, how to take a bath, then it goes into a submarine, then it goes into a forest, then it goes into um, a, in, in a, a cave in the forest, then it goes into a nightclub, and then it goes into a, a song about the fine, a final derriere, and then it goes into a sort of a, an enigmatic maternal gloop. And then, the, the neck, this, and then it works its way out of all those, and then the second act is nine lost film stories deep, and the third act is nine deep, and then all the, that so-called book of climaxes, which is... Um, so it's sort of shaped like a three-act movie, but not really, you know, with the result, you know, in, toward the end of the movie, you're still starting new narratives. Uh, the black and white one, for instance, which is longer, uh, the Duryanoskov, that's an adaptation of F.W. Murnau's Duryanoskov, uh, his Jack, 
his Jekyll and Hyde story he made just after Nosferatu, his Dracula. And, um, you know, it's, I've often regretted making the movie as long as I did because I could have just made it shorter. But, um, and maybe I should have, but I, I really wanted people to, f I just wanted the movie to be too much. <laughs> It is a bit exhausting, the movie. It's exhausting, and, and maybe in the wrong way, but, uh, at, but uh, there are no rules for filmmaking of this sort, you know? I didn't want, I could have made the movie 75 minutes long, but then it would have been a cute idea. You know, I wanted people, and, and I, it was any other story, when you're just telling one story, it's simple. You cut it as tightly as you can, and, and I know famously Robert Evans made Francis Coppola make The Godfather longer, you know, but that gave it the breathing room it needs, you know, but uh, yeah, he had it down to 90 minutes, but he made it, the producer made it, the director make it three hours long. But that, but here it's all counterintuitive because you're, what we're going for was, if the movie's about anything besides some wonky gender politics, it's, um, it's about too much narrative. And I just thought, well, I just, People aren't going to come back and watch this over and over and over again anyway. Maybe they'll dip in and revisit it. I want people to feel like they've just barely survived a drowning by narrative in a storm of stories and just been washed panting on the far shore. And um, it, was a, it was a calculated gamble and it, it probably blew up in our faces, but oh well, you know, the world is still fine. You know. Is your co-director credited on the film? Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering what that process was like and, and how that came about. I loved working with co-director. I worked with uh, Evan Johnson, who's my co-director. He was a student of mine when he was 18. We became friends, but I also, he, I hired him as an assistant, and we, and we started watching a lot of movies together. And at the start of this project, I, I hired him as a research assistant, just someone to keep me company while I was in a room looking up things. But he started to get really good ideas for the website. Um, his, uh, his idea that the website would not only produce new one-of-a-kind uh, movie uh, permutations and combinations, but it would destroy them forever too. That it would be a website that would produce a new movie and then lose it. Uh, it was a really good one. And, um, and he had so many other things and he just sort of took the lead in so many places that I felt like I had a real collaborator for once. Like someone who, who would argue with me without ever hurting my feelings and, and you could take a direct hit without taking it personally. It felt really good and we both wanted the same thing and we quite often when we disagreed just ended up with a, um, a third result rather than one of our two positions. And um, I loved it. He didn't call action or um, hold a camera in front of actors ever or call cut, but he was never farther away from me than um, him. and. Uh, and we consulted after every sequence of shots, if not every shot. And, and then he did all the post-production um, post color timing. And he did a lot of photography of, for, composition, uh, for compositing and things whenever a very small set needed to be expanded into a landscape or something like that. You know? So he was, it would be like saying, you know, an editor could easily be described as a filmmaker because an editor who's given a bunch of footage, say you're given a bunch of footage of... Uh, you know, a strike that happens or something like that, and you make a documentary about it, you're called the director, you know, and, um, and so, but my editor's called an editor because he does editing of footage I shoot and direct, but an editor could just as easily be called a co-director, and so I, I just thought he deserved, because uh, he did at least half, if not more than half of the work and creative thinking on the project, he deserved a, a co director's credit, and I'm happy to, uh, and I, I wish it was just director, directed by Guy Madden and Evan Johnson next time. It will be. We, we've agreed to work together indefinitely, but just one picture at a time. So, yeah, thanks. Uh, yes? Um, going back to me talking about narratives, so I thought about a couple of filmmakers, one being Alain Rene, specifically last year Mary Beth, right? So yeah. The genesis of nonlinear storytelling. Yeah. Right? But when it comes to sort of like how you use the camera, I think more of the dark. Right? Yeah. With like fast and sporadic it is. And I guess I'm curious sort of like how you structure your narrative in your films, right? Is it more towards gesture? You mentioned nesting, which I already got sort of like a sort of layering. Yeah. But there has to be something more than that, right? Because you're sort of trying to carry over a type of emotion 
our sensibility of like how you're supposed to connect to the characters through each nested layer of your character. Yeah. I don't know how, this is a real strange one because I'll, since the stories weren't originally, separate stories weren't originally written to be nested Russian doll style inside each other, um, but they're all written, they're all adapted by the same people, so there's a kind of a thematic rhyming in them sometimes. I don't know how emotional the stories are, frankly. I wish they were a bit more emotional in my the other portions of my career I was starting to make um, in the conventional, more conventional, um, narrative films that I'd been making. I'd been making some progress towards um, achieving some sort of emotional effect. I, I, I've always tried to be really honest when I'm making the films about myself and about people, and even if it's uncomfortable, and I, and I, I don't know, I want people to laugh and feel and cry at the same time, I don't know. But I know that this one isn't very emotional, it's just too distant, it's too, it's too manufactured. Um, but... But the tone's still consistent though, this most of the Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I'm trying to get back to your question. Yeah, the, the camera work is just uh, the, an artifact of, it's just a, the product of my... Um, a sh I wanted the movies to be sort of charged with an energy, but just moving the camera around fast doesn't guarantee uh, a kinetic uh, plot. You know, that's, there's a craft to screenwriting uh, for melodrama where you literally have to create like a hook and a tipping point and stuff like that. And I don't have that mastered. I'm like only now, long overdue, consulting how to write screenplay books and things like that, just to know what what rules to break if I feel like it. But I, um, every now and then I would copy as a, um, well, I would be copying a synopsis that worked really well. So in some stories work better than others. And in other ones, I would just tell the story. And with intertitles, you get to cheat a lot. If the story wasn't told properly, you just get to tell, you know, with a flowery intertitle, you can just get disguise some exposition and just get the story told that way, and you have to do a lot of reading. Um, but I think to get um, some sort of emotion around, you have to have, some, I don't know, it's, I'm no master at this stuff. I, the camera movements have to match, like they have to f sync up with your story. It has to be, each story has a certain style. I, I remember the first time I really moved the camera a lot and crazily, in a movie was a very low budget movie I made called Cowards Bend the Knee and for some it was based on, um, it has a good plot because it was based on Euripides Electra which is a great plot and um, I just uh, consciously took the plot and used it as a structure, a durable 2500 year old proven structure that's never gone out of print and I happen to have a, a personal story that I could just drape characters over onto this structure and it, and it worked. And for some reason, the story was kind of crazy and elliptical and, high, and, and hysteric. And uh, that camera style that I, I just adopted then, I, I, I was too pressed for time to storyboard, so I just started connecting actors. And I, there'd be seven actors in a room at once, and i go, oh yeah, I forgot one. And I, so I'd just swish pan the camera over rather than cutting. And, and somehow it all worked really well. And then in my next movie, I tried the same style, but the script had been written more languidly and that, that style didn't work. And I suddenly found the camera slowing down. It just naturally slowed down. And, um, but I tend to write, I'm more comfortable writing in a zone where there's some delirium because I've, um, the great uh, miles, emotional milestones in my life have often been anesthetized by um, a certain amount of delirium. You know, the, the, an important death or an important birth or something, I don't know, I always just don't know what's going on, like I, I just can't take in the moment, in the moment, so there's a kind of a delirium that I enjoy encountering in literature and in film, and I default to it, it reminds me of a bedtime story told to someone half asleep, so I, I kind of default to that achronological delirium combined with a frenzied camera style wherever possible, because I'm always just remembering things and stuff. It's my way of being personal, but I, I I want to actually consciously, I've, I've done it now, I've really done it, and I, I want to, um, I want to move on. Yes? I was wondering if you could um, talk a little bit more about 
about, as you mentioned, like wonky gender politics, and um, I was thinking about like as you're encountering all these old stories, um, that it's like there's both like a love for the old story and a lot to like like faithfully make that story, but then also like a critique of how the roles play out in that story. And um, it's it's tough uh, because um, you learn a lot about world history, American history, pop culture history by reading these synopses, you find out that, say, Lois Weber, a great filmmaker, a really good storyteller, um, is said by some people, I don't quite believe this, was as popular as D.W. Griffith in his day, you know, 100 years ago. Um, she certainly made good-looking movies, and I'm sure they were very popular. Um, and she was considered very progressive. She's a strong feminist, believed in suffrage, you know, the vote. Um, she believed in birth control, and she believed in eugenics, which, you know, calls for the compulsory sterilization of, uh, of uh, criminals, uh, poor people, uh, people with mental handicaps. Um, eh, you know, it's considered very progressive at the time because everyone was just cottoning on to, you know, with Darwinism and selective breeding and, you know, like, was really entering the common, the the common consciousness and so is considered progressive but you know from this hundred years later we can see potential insensitivities and in that sort of thing so I had um, I had to ask myself and of course all almost all movies uh, made in America in the last hundred years are sexist and racist um, like to this day probably I don't know who am I to say but uh, there's, there's probably still some room for improvement so at what point do you, are you delighted to find out that, um, that a movie is so crazily anti-socialist that it's actually fascist, but it was popular? You're delighted to find out that Lois Weber was like believed in compulsory sterilizing, you know, and are you, what do you do with that when you're re adapting it? Do you take an, a clearly ironic and a safe distance from it? Do you omit it altogether? Do you, um, uh, you know, like do you just imitate it perfectly and just say, well, I didn't do, I didn't do it, <laughs> you know, like some, uh, some old filmmaker did it, you know, like it was unbelievably offensive, you know. Um, there's uh, the old roots, you know, there's, there was an old tradition pops up on Turner Classic Movies all the time, blackface, you know. Do you do that, you know, like prob probably not necessary. <laughs> but we're, you know, but there's lots of stuff that's like that, and then the gender politics. We decided the th three male screenwriters in the writing room decided to just try to be as honest about themselves as possible, and we wrote scripts in which men mostly inter like gave assistance to women, whether they asked for it or not, and, um, and didn't really end up helping the women much. It was just sort of kind of a cinema history version of mansplaining, maybe. I don't know, we just, but we tried to be honest. You know, there's the, say, that trained psychiatrist who just decides he's going to cure this beautiful woman, he, this woman he finds attractive, that he wouldn't just do it to anybody. He's interested in her. And so he starts to mansplain her, and all he does is reveal to her that her, her inner child is she doesn't want to see, you know. And um, there's all those lumberjacks that decide that some woman's been kidnapped and they want to rescue her, but she doesn't seem to be in any trouble at all. And I don't know, it's, it, it's, I just decided that all I knew, I don't know anything about in, in gender terms. I can't claim to know anything more than just what I, whatever I happen to be, uh, know and feel. So... But I know uh, I'm most comfortable when I think of myself as a preposterous person. <laughs> and um, I like Bunuel's Lage d'Or, uh, which is not just melodramatic, but surrealist. So it, it, it stresses the subconscious is just coming out. So it, I don't know if anyone here has seen it, but it's male lead, Gaston. It's got two leads, a male lead and a female lead. And I think, I think Bunuel... Uh, seems over his long career to be pretty f uh, a pretty fair humanist and he's really gets really angry about social unfairness and things like that i have no idea where he was on gender politics considering you know 
a lot of factors. But anyway, um, I like in that movie the fact that the male lead is also a surrealist male, so he's just acting out on impulses. A surrealist male is just acting out um, subconscious. The subconsciousness is just out there. It's disinhibited. So he's selfish, he's childish, he's even infantile, and he's bratty, and he's violent, and he looks ridiculous. But he's also kind of charismatic, too. And so he's just someone like a kind of a Daffy Duck character, or George Costanza, or I don't know, or uh, Larry David, or it's just someone you like to watch self-immolate, you know. But it's someone you find yourself in all the time, too. So it's, so I don't know. Uh, so there tended to be in this version of the movie, the way it cut together fewer female leads than there are in The Great Project. That uh, I wish there were more, but it's just we sort of shat the bed for diversity. Um, it, when the movie, when the dust settled on assembling this movie, I think we score slightly better um, on, all di on all diversity issues on the website. But I, it's it's something I'm throwing a penalty flag down on myself for. I wish I'd done, wish I'd done better. I don't know if that answered your question or avoided it. I'm sorry. Oh, thanks. Okay. Yeah, I, I take it really seriously. Um, but that doesn't mean I succeeded. <laughs> so, but thanks. Can you perhaps, uh, it's a very different, uh, almost superficial question, but all of your films up to, I don't know if up to now, you had shot on film on celluloid. Yeah. And then you make a film on digital, yet it looks very similar to your previous, I mean... Or it looks more filmic, actually. Almost, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it has it's full of digital effect. artifacts, but it also has more film decay uh, yeah. artifacts in it than, a, than any of my other stuff did, yeah. So can you talk a little bit about the aesthetic choice of, even though you're shooting on digital, to make it pass, not make, make it pass, but what, what is this fixation with this uh, look, and also the process of it, because I, I can, and I've never seen digital look like this. Yeah. And I was actually surprised when I learned it was digital, so can you? Um, I, uh, well, probably everyone has heard at one time or another, whether they remember it or not, that film is the haunted medium. You know, you, if I take a picture of you, immediately the image of you and you start diverging in time. You know, there's the recorded image of you at precisely, you know, four minutes to nine on April 1st, 2016. But then you are getting, you know, you, you're now 30 seconds older. This image is 30 seconds older, but in a different way. Who knows what its pixels are doing? Uh, and in film emulsion terms, it ages in ways we're all familiar with because we get to look at photos that are over 100 years old now. And um, so in other words, when I look at an image of you that, uh, that I just took, I'm already looking at a facsimile of you the way you were a minute ago. And if I look at that picture 10 years from now, I'm looking at a former version of yourself. If someone looks at it 100 years from now, you're a ghost, uh, literally. Uh, but it could be argued that you're always looking at something that is no more, um, that isn't at all. And, um, and that's a ghost. And uh, so even if it's living people up there moving around, they're already different. So, what you're looking at, it's the same. And, and in, I first started thinking of this on my first trip to France when I went to go to a movie and the movie screenings in the paper were just called seances. And uh, the word seance, uh, the French word just meaning a seating. And so you're at a seance now. Um, you're, uh, the, um, in North America, we consider a seance a paranormal seating. You sit down, the lights go down, and you look at something that isn't really there. And um, there's a medium some fraud, a uh, total charlatan in charge of the affair of uh, this paranormal seance. But it's the same thing with a movie seance. You sit and watch something that's not really there. And um, the lights go up at the end. You decide whether you were taken in or not. Uh, in all cases, you come because you want to believe in, for at least a while, uh, what you're looking at that isn't really there. You want to be enchanted. You want to believe in it. And it isn't really there. And then you decide later how enchanted you were. And in both cases, with the paranormal medium and the director, you're dealing with a charlatan, you know, a fraud, someone who's in charge of creating something that people want to believe in and 
but shouldn't. And, um, and that goes for documentary filmmakers, as you know, you're one. Um, and uh, sounds, by the sounds of it, a delightful one. Um, very mischievous. Uh, so when I s started thinking of the ways this movie should look, I, I started to think of this, the seance to spiritism from the golden age, the 1920s and 30s, when a lot of parents were grieving the loss of their sons in the Great War. Uh, they, would hold, they would go to seances in a desperate attempt to make contact with them. And, but a lot of the seances featured in photographs are just conspicuously trumped up photos of, of people in trances with cotton batten or cheesecloth coming out of their orifices, with dripping with something gooey. And sometimes a photograph would be embedded in it or whatever. And I often wondered what that stuff would look like actually moving, but you never saw motion pictures of it. And, um, but then I, I started to watch Bill Morrison's movie, Decasia, uh, where he, he f takes old films that are on the verge of just, just falling apart completely. They're buckling. And, um, and he made one called Light is Calling that's on YouTube. It's really gorgeous, where he took a f film that's really just mostly mildew and oxidization and buckling and, and, and and, it, and the images literally start oozing and blobbing and, and coming closer to the eye and then and fading away again. And I realized this is like ectoplasm, what, if it moved, you know, and, and how appropriate that it's moving this way, this blobby way in, in the most haunted medium. And, um, and so I decided that's the way I wanted, that we wanted. And Evan, uh, meanwhile, had been working on abusing some software so it would produce exactly the opposite results of what it was set out to do, to destabilize things. And I can't reveal the secret recipe or it'll kill me, but it's basically, it's, he designed a program that created happy accidents. I, I, I used to have a million happy accidents. When I worked with film, I would read the light meter wrong, so things would be overexposed or underexposed, or a light leak in the camera would fog everything, or the lab would overcook it and produce too much grain, or, or drop water spots on things that look like paramecium skipping around for a while. And there'd be a million happy accidents, but when I first started shooting digital, I was suicidal with the lack of accident, the consistent lack of accidents. And so he set a goal for himself to make um, accidents happen in my life again, and, and technological accidents. They just happened mostly outside of, the most frequent accident I had on set was I would shoot an entire scene thinking I had pressed record, and I hadn't, and then I would go, okay, cut, perfect, and press record, and then, you know, and then record my feet walking to the bathroom or something like that, the, the cruisiest bathroom in Paris. And, uh, you know, the footage was spectacular, but it had nothing to do with my movie. Um, so those weren't useful accidents. So uh, the, the footage was, he cooked up something that looked like a cross between Bill Morrison and uh, seance to spiritism things. By the way, um, in Quebec, where I shot half of this, the word uh, seance means a really dull meeting. <laughs> so there's three meanings to it. And so when I go to see Guy Band films, I see the Dead Father, I see the, the Flapper Girls, and I, and I see these other kinds of instruments. Am I going to keep seeing them over and over again? Do you going to keep recombining this kind of DNA? I think I, uh, I, I feel like I've, I feel like I've, got it all out of my system here. And I really enjoyed, my most recent film is shorter, you've seen it. It's a very modest cine essay on the making of another a Canadian war movie. It's shot in 2015 in Jordan, using you know, all contemporary things. And there's still plenty of room for color timing and mischief, and, uh, but it's, it's just not an old timey thing. You know, it's uh, so, but I still care a lot for sound design of a sort, and, um, and I don't know, I think my tastes are broadening out, and I definitely am getting tired of old-timey tropes. Jeez, I, time passes so quickly, I didn't realize I'd been doing them for so long, but I have been. And, um, but I, I'm still excited about filmmaking, more often than not, and uh, I think I've left it behind, but there are still more permutations. I guess my seances website is, looks like this world, except even more manipulated, more interventions. And there's more digital uh, elements to it as well. Lots of data moshing artifacts and things like that. I, I really like the way it looks, I have to say. 
And I, I can't take credit for it because my uh, collaborators, uh, Evan and Galen, have been working on that with, with my uh, full enthusiastic approval, but they've been creating a lot of that, so I really like it. Yes. Um, well, first off, congratulations on successfully filming <coughs> yourself out of Winnipeg. I see some <laughs> made in New Jersey. That's <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh, well, uh, yeah, I can feel Winnipeg pulling me back, but no, no. I'm... Um, I was wondering if there was a reason why you made certain people silent throughout the dialogue scenes, because it seemed kind of 50-50 and it ended up hanging on the sketch. Like, was there a plan on who you would actually have the voice recordings of, or was it on the fly on who would be silent during this sequence, who would be... All sorts of different reasons. Sometimes uh, the sound recording was just inaudible. Sometimes some of the French actors couldn't speak English and they, remem they remembered their lines phonetically. The cue cards are so cute. Just these little in French phonetics and you're, you're, re you're reading something that looks like another language altogether and you're reading it out loud but it's English. And, um, but a lot of times the accent was so thick you couldn't understand it. So uh, other times the performances maybe weren't so great and you just cut them out or other times um, you wanted to change what they said so you just <laughs> change what they said <laughs> I don't know and um, as a, yeah 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 no as a matter of fact uh, in the uh, the website version of this each story has many different versions and so um, because I set out to make a hundred lost movie adaptations but I only made 30 something um, I got to add the other 70 adaptations in just by changing the intertitles and putting them right into the movies I shot, you know, and then fragmenting them and mashing them up and stuff like that. So, uh, so it's, it's, and also just for the sheer pleasure of being inconsistent sometimes. The same idea of just making you aware that this is a, just in case you needed reminding, something that was made by a human. Oh, having said that, the website is full of ra computer random generated things like crazy, so I don't know. What do you mean? Uh, well, there's a title generator. Um, let's see, I've been kind of addling my uh, brain cells with metadata lately. Um, the website, um, when you visit it, you start clutching at a sort of a sea of words that are genres, really strange, many, there's hundreds of genres and subgenres of movies and uh, different words that, uh, that will eventually make up a title of the movie you see. And you eventually can clutch on a few and all of a sudden the seance starts because some words kind of connect with each other. And a program will take, it'll take the fragments of three movie adaptations that I've shot and combine them. And it'll take metadata from that, metadata, and, um, and create a title out of words that are tagged for each movie and so the very first time we did that I was pleased because the very first title to come out of the program was um, Wise Trumpets of the Milky Midnight and it was uh, kind of charming watched it it was yeah, it was interesting in places very non sequitur adult and dreamy and a little anticlimactic and then it ended and then that movie was destroyed and Wise Trumpets of the Milky Midnight will never be seen again uh, but uh, and that's all um, very little interactivity, just some random grabbing, and then the, once <coughs> some words are grabbed, a computer will just randomly produce a combination of movie elements, and that, that combination will produce a title. And so it's, but I'm kind of delighted by random generated things anyway. It's not so unrelated to the way, to Louis Benoel's one or two martinis before starting to write, <laughs> you know, just have to, create, just, just lubricate the randomness a little bit to allow it to happen. Okay. Yeah. Can you talk about the um, use of pastiche in your work? The use of which, sorry? Pastiche. Pastiche, yeah. You know, I, I have to confess, I'm not even sure what pastiche means exactly, but, you know, maybe if you want to define it in a sentence, but I, I think I know what it means. Um, well, it's, yeah, homage or... Yeah, I've always, I've, you know, people of, uh, reviewers have always been kind to me because I think the movies are fun to write about um, for reviewers. So I've often gotten a higher Metacritic rating than maybe I deserve because the writers just enjoy, it's a break from the monotony of writing about usual 
releases. Um, and they often say things like the movies are full of references, but I've actually never consciously referenced anything. I'm just recycling vocabulary units that seem to be perfectly good. You know, it's, there's a kind of a chestnut about silent film was still thriving with so much potential left as an art form when the industry suddenly demanded, you know, uh, the studios got com suddenly got competitive with each other with, by introducing talking pictures, Warner Brothers first, or Vitagraph, then Warner Brothers, and then, um, and then so all of a sudden, the aesthetics of film sort of stumbled for a few years uh, while talking was initiated, but it left a lot of unexploited um, silent film possibilities uh, behind. And I've always just thought of myself as a, such a scavenger, just, just getting, just hopping off the contemporary bandwagon and just going back and picking up these still in perfect working order vocabulary units and just using them. And I, and I felt I could use a, a modern one as well as an ancient one, as well as, um, as a not so old one, and that I could just mix and match them, much the way I guess postmodernist writers might, you know, just keep playing with genres and things like that. I wasn't quite sure what I was doing, nor had I been a student of literary theory or film theory. I was just doing it instinctively, the way my daughter would add a seashell to a, a crayon drawing and glue it on, or a noodle even, or something, you know, I, I was just adding things that felt, they felt honest, and they felt a little bit gimmicky to me, I was sort of hoping. I wasn't like a out, total outsider artist, I was really, when I, when I started in the 80s, I really followed contemporary music closely and trends, even from Winnipeg, I had, you know, it was a lot of trouble to follow what was going on in London and New York and things, but I tried to do it, I felt fairly hip, and I felt I was making something that would stand a chance of traveling. But I, but I also was still just working kind of in ignorance and by gut instinct with combination of things. So there, when I made my first movie, I, I didn't even know I'd have a visual style. I just read a, a book on how to make a film, or I read the first chapter on how to light. And it was, you know, have a key light, and then a fill light to soften the shadows a little bit, and then have a rim light from behind to just help a subject pop out from the background. And, but uh, I was so terrible that when I first set up all the lights, on the very first uh, day of shooting, all I got was my actor with three nose shadows. And, uh, and so I unplugged the rim light and got it down to like two nose shadows. I unplugged the fill light, got it down to one nose shadow, moved his head till the, the shadow that shaped like a Hitler mustache disappeared and, and then shot. And then I, when I got the footage back, it actually was an illumined subject grading off into blackness. And all of a sudden it seemed like my movies looked like a couple of German expressionist movies I'd seen stills from. And I started watching expressionist films and realized that they kind of approached storytelling the way I did. And I only when I started accidentally making movies that looked kind of expressionist, did I become a fan of expressionism and begin to understand what it is, you know, where the outer landscape is supposed to match the interior landscape of a character and all the shadows and fear and paranoia and uh, all that stuff. So I sort of just kind of evolved into what I am because it's what I, it's the only thing I could do. So I never saw them as homages. They were just things like just me, just being a magpie, really, just stealing some things and, and just, and trying, trying anything, yeah. And, pu and putting them into the service of stories that mattered to me, you know. Uh, these stories maybe matter less to me than, than the, they were their own. These are, I guess, homages, they're tributes to lost films, you know, but, but uh, some other stories are about, you know, memories that haunt me and matter to me. And also these are so many stories. Too. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, that's, that's an hour. Anybody have yeah. any other questions? All right, thank you so You've much. been very patient. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's what bathing is all about. Have a nice day.